In May 2020, China's Communist Party announced plans to push through a new and highly contentious national security law for Hong Kong, one that is expected to give Beijing new powers to crush dissent. Well, China's premier defended the decision, saying that the national security laws protect the long-term prosperity of the city. The Chinese government is now bypassing the city's legislature to rush through a strict new national security law. The proposed new law will ban sedition, secession and treason, which means any protest could be punished more severely than in the past. Crimes like treason can mean life in prison. We didn't expect this. We didn't expect this full-scale frontal attack. Oh, this is the end of Hong Kong as we know it. Beijing passed the wide-reaching legislation in June 2020. Even though the national security law has a lot of support from pro-establishment lawmakers in Hong Kong, including Chief Executive Carrie Lam, democracy activists in the territory fear that Hong Kong is entering a new era of a reign of terror. Joshua Wong is considered the international face of this cause. The 23-year-old has served time in prison for his role in pro-democracy protests, and now he's again speaking out for the local population. He warns that the sweeping powers granted to Beijing under this law will turn the city into a secret police state. Another big worry? Protesters like him now face high possibilities of being extradited to China's courts for trials and life sentences. Are you afraid of going back to prison? Uh, the court trial may take place in mainland China. And as the one who has been jailed in Hong Kong for three times, uh, I think now we need to consider to face the risk that we might be jailed in Beijing. After the law unanimously passed in China's legislature, the city's pro-democracy political party, founded by Wang in 2016, said it would disband and cease all operations as a group. Beijing's move to tighten its grip jeopardizes the freedoms that China guaranteed to Hong Kong for 50 years when the UK handed it over in 1997. Now, Hong Kong people are to run Hong Kong. That is the promise, and that is the unshakable destiny. All this is happening with an ongoing global pandemic as a backdrop. Protesters are now defying social distancing mandates and taking to the streets to speak out against the law. They have been met by armored vehicles, water cannon, and riot police, a response Amnesty International has condemned as an indiscriminate and excessive use of force. Hong Kong's special status with the United States looks to be under threat. The Trump administration says it no longer considers Hong Kong separate from mainland China, a declaration which could mean significant fallout for one of the world's largest financial centers. The Hong Kong that we knew as this big Asian financial hub is going to change in certain ways. Companies may be incentivized to move away from uh, the city, and in fact, uh, there may even be a brain drain of talent of people who don't want the kinds of restrictions that Beijing will impose. They may feel incentivized to move to London or New York. If the U.S. removes the preferential treatment Hong Kong receives compared with mainland China, it could also put at risk tens of billions of dollars of trade between Hong Kong and the United States, and potentially discourage people and companies from investing there. Without a seamless east-west conduit for international finance and trade, some experts caution it could also hurt China. The question now, is this the end of Hong Kong as an international financial center? What would that mean for multinationals operating there? And perhaps most importantly, does China still need Hong Kong to serve as that bridge from east to west? This is the border that separates Hong Kong from China. Now, what's confusing is that Hong Kong is technically in China, but it's categorized as something called a special administrative region. Now, what that means is that people on either side of this line have two different passports, two different currencies, and crucially, they observe two completely different ways of life. Here, citizens enjoy freedom of speech and religion. They're also able to assemble and demonstrate. And here, well, citizens don't really enjoy any of that. These privileges are the final vestige of Hong Kong's time under the rule of Imperial Britain. Before the UK gave Hong Kong back to China in 1997, leaders from the two countries came together to negotiate terms of the handover. Britain's only stipulation, Hong Kong must be allowed to maintain its way of life for a period of 50 years. 
Mrs. Thatcher signed the original deal on Hong Kong with the liberal Xia Zhang, now eclipsed by China's hardliners. This so-called one country, two systems model granted Hong Kong political and economic independence under its own mini constitution, something called the Basic Law, which is due to expire on July 1st, 2047. But China doesn't want to wait that long. For years, Beijing has made moves, big and small, to try to tighten its hold on the territory. Tensions escalated in 2012 over plans to adapt the city's public school curriculum to include what critics referred to as Chinese propaganda classes. Frustrations boiled over again in 2014, when Beijing introduced legislation designed to exert influence in Hong Kong's elections. In 2019, hundreds of thousands took to the streets to push back on an extradition bill that would have allowed Hong Kong residents to be tried in Chinese courts. But each time, protests were mostly successful in staving off these proposals, if only temporarily. 2020, however, appears to be different. The pro-Beijing chief executive who runs the city's legislature has already approved a contentious mainland law that makes it a criminal offense to disrespect China's national anthem, punishable by up to three years in prison. And then there's the national security law, which experts argue is far worse than any previous attempt to encroach on the city's civil liberties. Somewhat ironically, the call to enact this law actually comes from a clause in the territory's own mini constitution, the very document designed to protect its freedoms. It's right here in Article 23. The Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, quote, shall enact laws on its own to prohibit any act of treason, secession, sedition, or subversion against the central people's government. But here's the thing. In the decades since the basic law took effect in 1997, the Hong Kong government has never gone through with enacting it because of pervasive fear that doing so would ultimately jeopardize the city's rights, like freedom of speech. As part of its annual parliament, China announced plans to impose the national security law on the city without Hong Kong's permission. In doing so, China circumvented the city's independent legislative process entirely, a move that effectively begins to erode the very structure that grants the region major privileges on the world stage. In June 2020, state-run news agency Xinhua unveiled key details of the legislation. While Hong Kong's judicial and policing infrastructure would be enlisted to help enforce the new law, it also calls for some pretty big overhauls to the existing system. For example, Beijing plans to set up a special office in Hong Kong, tasked with gathering intelligence and prosecuting crimes considered a threat against national security. The law would also enable Beijing to override Hong Kong's legal system by giving the central government jurisdiction over criminal cases under specific circumstances. Chief Executive Carrie Lam would see new powers as well. She would be granted the authority to assign specific judges to preside over national security cases. Another critical nuance, the national security legislation would supersede existing local laws that may conflict with it, a stipulation that could potentially undermine existing legal precedent in the territory. The Xinhua statement did also say that the new law would protect freedom of expression, the press, and assembly, but did not provide details. Critics aren't so sure. China constantly uses national security as a reason for saying, I don't have to abide by any rules. I can arrest you without any need for explanation. What kind of impact do you think this will have on Hong Kong as a global financial center? Well, the point to all this is you've really introduced what's known as a chilling effect on the overall business environment. So why is Beijing cracking the whip now? Well, with the West largely distracted by the coronavirus pandemic and superpowers like the US already retrenching under increasingly isolationist policies, some experts say that the timing of the national security law actually makes a lot of sense. Also at play here, a need to shore up support at home. China's handling of the outbreak in Wuhan invited the wrath not just of the international community, but also of some mainland Chinese citizens. Add to this the fact that China's economy is in bad shape. It took a big hit from COVID-19, but even before that, growth was slowing. 2020 marked the first time in decades that the party opted not to set a growth target for the economy. Some analysts say Beijing needed a quick fix to repair its image at home, which is where Hong Kong comes into view. Getting the city to fall into line is a hugely popular mission among the general population, one that could help distract from other problems. This new law 
would also include uh, uh, the fight against uh, local, quote and unquote, uh, terrorism in Hong Kong means that they're targeting at the our protesters, especially our young. Well, Beijing obviously thinks that this is going to be a, a knockout blow for the Hong Kong, the democracy movement. But then I have uh, the confidence in our young in particular, because they are fighting for their future. But perhaps the biggest factor at play here is that China just doesn't need Hong Kong nearly as much as it used to. Back in the 1990s, Hong Kong accounted for 27% of the Chinese economy. Now it represents less than 3%. China's megacities like Shenzhen, Beijing, Shanghai, Chongqing, and Guangzhou have seen explosive growth since the 1990s. Instead of having one hub city attracting foreign investment and workers, China now has several, and without the red tape that comes along with Hong Kong's special status, which means the Chinese government has fewer and fewer incentives to keep Hong Kong happy and economically independent. China has been relying less and less on Hong Kong for years now. Shanghai has become a major business hub, attracting multinationals from around the globe. And Shenzhen, a metropolis to the north of Hong Kong, has grown into a massively productive manufacturing powerhouse that helped turn China into the world's biggest exporter. But Hong Kong's status as one of Asia's most prominent financial hubs will be hard to shake. Hong Kong's seamless interface with the West, not to mention its massive port, make it a very easy place to do business with global investors. For much of its history, Hong Kong has functioned as a key east-west conduit for global finance and trade, thanks in large part to its independent judiciary and regulators, which guarantee an ironclad rule of law. Although multinational companies now run out of both mainland China and Hong Kong, international businesses and investors trust Hong Kong's legal system. Operating out of the mainland is a trickier proposition, given its authoritarian legal system and strict capital controls. So even though Hong Kong doesn't contribute nearly as much to China's annual GDP as it once did, Hong Kong does remain an important lifeline to cash from the Western world. Most of the foreign direct investment flowing into and out of China goes through Hong Kong. Chinese companies also prefer Hong Kong when it comes to raising and borrowing money. Take a look at this chart comparing the amount of cash raised by mainland businesses going public across the major stock exchanges. The Hong Kong exchange dominates. The city is just as popular when it comes to helping mainland businesses borrow cash through bonds or loans. Hong Kong is also home to private banking, fintech, and derivatives trading. But perhaps the biggest difference between Beijing and Hong Kong is access to the global currency market. China has used Hong Kong's financial institutions to help prop up its national currency. In June 2020, Chief Executive Carrie Lam unveiled a new proposal to transform the city into a more prominent offshore center for the Chinese Yuan, one part of a larger initiative to further integrate the city with the financial markets of mainland China. But perhaps the city's greatest advantage is its position as a major offshore funding center for U.S. dollars. The Hong Kong dollar has been pegged to the greenback since 1983, which has been key to ensuring financial stability. Investors typically feel safe leaving their cash in Hong Kong and dealing in Hong Kong's local currency because it's easily convertible to U.S. dollars. This is a big part of what propelled Hong Kong to become the premier financial hub that it is today. And it is, according to analysts, one of its most important contributions to China. What's changed for Hong Kong over the years is it's a much smaller part of China's GDP today than it was 20 years ago. But even so, it's still a vital component in that it provides dollar financing for much of China's big companies that use Hong Kong for that very fact. So any pressure from the United States could hurt. Some China watchers say that American threats to upend Hong Kong's special privileges might include limiting the city's access to U.S. dollars, a move which could potentially set off a domino effect, beginning with capital flight and culminating in a currency collapse and huge losses to investors. Investors. But this outcome is part of the nuclear scenario, one that analysts think is highly unlikely. Hong Kong's economic stability was in question even before the announcement of the new national security law. 2019's pro-democracy protests effectively shut down commerce. No one was going out, shops and restaurants closed early, and tourism took a massive hit. That, paired with an atmosphere of eroding freedom, 
sent the territory's economy into a recession in 2019. Now, the new legislation, which bars subversion of state power, terrorism activities, and foreign interference, has only served to further foment unrest across the territory. But I think the bigger issue is one of confidence in terms of people. Do they want to continue working there? Businesses, do they want to assume the risks that that can change? Anytime the, the party decides they want to invoke national security, all sorts of things can happen. Over 1,300 American businesses are operating in Hong Kong. And more than 80% of the U.S. companies in the territory that were surveyed by the American Chamber of Commerce said that they're concerned about China's move to enact the new national security law citing fears over the potential impact on basic civil liberties. They've detained, for example, uh, foreigners who are active in the mainland investigating stock frauds. Uh, that's a huge issue for investors. And uh, that kind of transparency could be directly affected. If you, if you have any involvement with a state-owned enterprise or even state-affiliated enterprise, also at stake, major privileges long afforded to Hong Kong under the 1992 U.S.-Hong Kong Policy Act. Trade between the United States and Hong Kong was about $66 billion in 2019. The National Australia Bank said in a note on May 28th that the U.S. has opened the door for possible tariffs on imports from Hong Kong, visa restrictions, or asset freezes for top officials. The Trump administration has already begun to take action, with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announcing new visa restrictions on Chinese officials responsible for restricting freedoms in Hong Kong. But the U.S. perhaps has the greatest potential to inflict pain if it decides to restrict imports of sensitive technology to Hong Kong-based firms. Hong Kong will become just like another Chinese city, but for those companies that have uh, you know, interest where data is very important, say finance, say uh, anything related to medicine or, or, or business information, business intelligence. Well, a lot of those operations might end up going to a place like Singapore, which is seen as untainted by the threat of Chinese national security laws. What's considered the most likely outcome for Hong Kong is something far less dramatic. Hong Kong is losing its um special positions as a guarantee safe haven for uh, Western business people operating in the greater China area. But Hong Kong still has a, an independent judiciary and the erosion of Hong Kong's judicial independence is likely to be a slow process. So the erosion is something that I think the business communities can live with until it finally passes a point or something dramatic that happens which triggers a change in their assessment, they will continue to soldier on for as long as they can. After all, Hong Kong will still be better than Shanghai or Shenzhen. So it isn't all bad news for Hong Kong, at least in the short term. It could mean more money from Chinese companies retreating to Asia from Wall Street. In immediate short term, Hong Kong may well benefit, but the benefit from the um, U.S. government's move to delist a good number of mainland Chinese companies operating in the U.S. New York exchange. Uh, for a lot of those companies that will be delisted from New York, they are likely to seek listing in Hong Kong. In June 2020, online retailer JD.com became the latest major Chinese firm to carry out a secondary listing in Hong Kong. That meant a fresh injection of cash in Hong Kong and potentially an insurance policy for JD.com if the U.S. does end up delisting Chinese companies. The new law also appears to have the backing of HSBC and Standard Chartered, two of Hong Kong's biggest banks. In a written statement, the London-based HSBC said it believed the law would help the territory to recover and rebuild its economy. However, statements such as this are unusual and can't always be taken at face value. HSBC only issued its post after a former Hong Kong chief executive publicly singled them out for having not expressed support. The long-term play isn't quite as optimistic for Hong Kong. Some foresee a deglobalized Hong Kong made up of eroding institutions and freedoms with a muzzled capital market and an ever-growing dependence on the mainland. An outcome that may not seem all that unpalatable to multinational firms that have already grown accustomed to dealing directly with the mainland. 
Many Western companies have been forced to do business with the Chinese government in the mainland for decades, slowly chipping away at Hong Kong's significance as a safe haven for business with China. Even before the national security law was announced, Hong Kong had already dropped from third to sixth place from September 2019 to March 2020 in a twice yearly ranking of the world's global financial centers. It was overtaken by Tokyo, Shanghai, and Singapore, and Beijing was trailing just behind it at number seven. The battle over Hong Kong's autonomy is just the latest flashpoint, and what some analysts say could become a new Cold War one that pits the U.S. against China. It comes right amid a larger, bigger war, a uh, trade war between China and the United States. And so it adds pressure points for the United States to hurt China if it wants to do that um, by sanctioning Hong Kong in different ways or by hurting its ability to function as a financial hub. Uh, and so in that sense, the United States has new leverage in its wider trade war against China. But even with America's strategic advantage in this particular battle, experts warn that both sides have something to lose if the U.S. takes overly aggressive steps against Hong Kong. When we had a Cold War with the Soviet Union, you didn't see so many American companies actively invested in, in the country. You didn't see the sort of trade volumes you currently have between the U.S. and China, and in this case, also Hong Kong. So it's a very different kind of Cold War. The European Parliament voted on June 19th to take China to the International Court of Justice in The Hague over the new law. And Britain has said it would offer as many as 3 million Hong Kong residents passports and a route to citizenship. But for now at least, Hong Kong's international status doesn't appear to be at risk. The World Trade Organization still plans to categorize Hong Kong as an independent customs territory. And as for the local Hong Kong population that's on the ground fighting back against the national security law, they are appealing to the international community to intervene. Because for them, it's not just Hong Kong hanging in the balance. Hong Kong is the place I born, I live and I love. And it's, um, live Hong Kong might not be an option for me, but you need to keep on the fight. Hong Kong uh, already turned to be the nightmare. And I just also encourage the Western country to realize that the first is Hong Kong, the next is Taiwan, and later on is the rest of the world.